Whenever you're ready, Carolyn, feel free to unmute yourself. The, so the mute button is um, where there's a little microphone. If you're on a computer, it's on the bottom left-hand side. Um, do you want to do you want to leave and come back maybe oh stan's coming Can you click on it, honey? Got it? Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Carolyn Lundbeck. Uh, I'm a member of the Congregation Agudat Akim of Huntington and State College, and I'm happy to be hosting tonight's program. It's the first in a series called An Evening of Learning, presented by professors from Penn State's Department of Jewish Studies program. This is provided under the auspices of the Central Pennsylvania Small Congregations Initiative, which brings together 17 congregations from the region. The conveners are the group of Jewish Community Foundation of Central Pennsylvania and the Jewish Community Legacy Project. The program is being recorded and will be available on the Jewish Community Foundation's YouTube channel. We'll send the link after the program. Tonight's program is entitled Networks and Chains, the Paths of Jewish Migrants from Central and Eastern Europe to Chicago before 1914, presented by Professor Tobias Brinkman. I had the pleasure of meeting Professor Brinkman yesterday who explained to me his long-term interest in Jewish migration to the United States and other countries. This particular program details migration to the Chicago area in the early 1900s, where Jewish residents built a community, established their businesses, prospered, built a synagogue as well. There's a special book that Professor Brinkman wrote, Sundays at Sinai, and that tells the story of celebrations at that synagogue. Please welcome Professor Brinkman now. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you so much for the introduction. I really appreciate it. I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay. Okay, great. So, um, <clears throat> Yeah, thanks again for the invitation. I'm also the director of the Jewish Studies Program, so I'm uh, really excited that we can um, participate in this uh, program. I We feel really strongly about outreach uh, to the community, and this is uh, really perfect uh, in many ways. And uh, I and my colleagues all do very different things, uh, so I think you get a quite the gamut uh, of, of uh, research. I'm really interested in migration. Um, you hear my accent. I'm, I should say a little bit uh, about myself. I'm originally from Germany. I'm not Jewish. Um, and I became really interested in uh, Jewish history um, 
simply growing up in Germany in the 70s and 80s, uh, for very complicated reasons, I uh, went to Eastern Europe a lot, where obviously um, uh, uh, pretty much every visit uh, uh, involved uh, looking at mass graves and memorials. So I became really interested uh, in that history. And uh, yeah, uh, and I ended up uh, with a PhD research topic when I was still in Germany, looking at the history of Jews in Chicago, um, Jews from the German speaking parts of Central Europe, uh, because that was an area that nobody had really covered much. There were a few uh, uh, Jewish refugees who came to America in the 30s and 40s, early 40s from Nazi Germany who who did actually do some uh, research in the 50s. But it is not a popular topic uh, because most Jews in the United States are uh, descended from Jews who came from Eastern Europe. And uh, the Jews already there didn't have, you know, they were well-to-do established and it was not a, it's a complicated relationship. So the so-called German Jews are uh, not obviously a topic that many people chose uh, in American Jewish history. So it's much more fun to work on, you know, uh, Jewish uh, trade unions, Jewish workers and Lower East Side and so forth. Uh, and, and, you know, writing a book about a rich uh, Jewish garment entrepreneur, not so attractive. And uh, so I looked at this from the other end. Uh, so really trying to figure out how did these uh, Jews come to America? Why did they go to Chicago? And uh, why does their story really matter? So in the talk, I'm going to provide first a little background, very general background, why people actually were moving. Jewish migrations are part of larger migrations. And that's the case for Jewish migrants from the German states who came before and after the Civil War. But it's also the case for Jews who came from Eastern Europe, a much larger group. Um, and then I'm talk, gonna talk a little bit about like big narratives about Jewish migration. I already touched on one, right? This German Jews and Russian Jews memory, this sort of image that's still pretty powerful, I think, in public memory. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about just the, my findings for Chicago. Uh, and I'm also gonna talk a little bit about my current research. I actually ended up writing a book about Jews leaving Eastern Europe uh, from 1860 to the 1960. So that's really a big picture book. Um, and I looked at the journeys. Uh, so I'm also going to talk a little bit about that to give you sort of a little background uh, about the other Jews who came after 1880. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, so first, generally, why did st people start moving? I'm just teaching a course in American Jewish history. I just, uh, we're in week two, and we're just talking about the American Revolution. And I'm just I was just explaining to students today that uh, people couldn't just go to America like in 1776. It was not possible. It was, it's not that there were ships in ports and you just had a regular service or anything. Most ships were part of some sort of enterprise. People, uh, investors uh, funded a journey. And so a poor person and most people were poor Christian and Jewish in Europe couldn't just hop on a boat. That was really not possible. So only relatively few people could make these crossings. And most of them were essentially professionals. They were connected to the colonial enterprise. So many were actually soldiers. Uh, some were merchants and traders. And that's pretty much about it. Uh, uh, the settlement was rather limited. Uh, that changes in the 1820s. And why does it change? There are a couple of bigger changes uh, uh, making the impact. Uh, around 1800 in the early 19th century. One is industrialization. So that's the steam engine and it rapidly changes how stuff is made. Simply put, more people move to cities where these factories are being built. Uh, and this has global repercussions. There's, uh, it's complex to explain it, but they're globalizing markets for, uh, work, for labor, so migrants, uh, for all sorts of goods um, and uh, also for information. Uh, information is also traveling faster. Steam technology, uh, initially it's the railroad, so mobility revolution. So more and more people can move. Uh, it becomes a business to take people. Uh, so there are all of a sudden, there actually are ships and ports that take normal people across the ocean. 
because it's a business and uh, these ships by the 1860s actually run on steam steam technology and they get bigger and bigger. And at that point, they're already railroad networks, right? So there's real changes. For most people in, in Europe, uh, this was not a very positive experience. Uh, so most people lost their jobs. Uh, many people had to find new work. They were yeah. displaced by technology. So they had to move to cities to work in factories. Uh, less and less people worked in the farm sector. And, uh, but for Jews uh, in Europe, this there were opportunities. Jews had been marginalized into sort of niches that all of a sudden became quite lucrative. And uh, that is not money lending, but it's uh, peddling. Most Jewish men in Europe uh, around 1800 or so, uh, and I'm talking 80%, uh, were peddlers. That was the niche. That was the only thing that Jews were allowed to do pretty much apart from money lending. And uh, selling things uh, becomes lucrative uh, in a new sort of industrial capitalist economy. Uh, and these peddlers were small entrepreneurs. So they knew a lot about risk. They knew a lot about fashion. They knew about markets. They sold clothes, used clothes. Uh, that's what everybody was wearing. And uh, so they were very open to new ideas, maybe making ready to wear clothes in a factory. Uh, it's hardly a coincidence that those people who were trading with clothes are the ones who are building the garment sector in uh, not just in the United States, but also in Germany it was completely dominated by Jew uh, Jewish migrants. A fascinating story. So these Jewish migrations uh, are all connected to global migrations. I give you just one example here just to explain this. Uh, in the 19th century, slavery was abolished. Uh, you know that. Uh, and all of a sudden, there's a real demand for cheap labor because uh, these plantations in the Caribbean, well, they couldn't use slaves no more uh, by the 1850s. So they're looking for cheap labor elsewhere. And this labor came from very distant places. Uh, there were people from South Asia uh, who uh, were recruited as cheap labor to work in plantations around the world. So uh, Tamils, uh, Hindus. And so to this very day in places like Trinidad, but also in the South Sea Islands, uh, there's a presence of uh, of the descendants of these migrants. So this is really a, a story of global migration and Jewish migrations are part of that. Chicago is really the epitome of a new city. So it's not as Chicago didn't exist in the colonial period. There was nothing there, uh, just indigenous people living in this area uh, at the you know sort of Western shore, Lake Michigan. And uh, it's a city that that is a product of these new changes of industrialization, urbanization, and globalizing markets for goods uh, and labor uh, and information. And uh, it grows quickly, rapidly. It's a rough place, uh, uh, but it's also a place that offers fascinating opportunities, uh, especially in the period before and after the Civil War. And this was a really good time to go to the Midwest, uh, to America for young Jewish men who were peddlers, uh, because there were a lot of opportunities uh, to accumulate a little money and then start entirely new businesses that hadn't existed before. Um, the obvious example is the Civil War. So there was a real demand for all the stuff that uh, these small businesses that Jewish immigrants had built were making. So. Uh, uniforms, right? Boots, uh, um, all this uh, processed meat that's beginning, the processed meat industry. So that was a real shift. The Civil War made a lot of these small business owners quite wealthy, um, Jews and non-Jews, obviously. So Chicago moves very quickly from a peripheral city out west, uh, uh, becomes an economic hub. Uh, the focus of the city, it's very simple. Chicago essentially is a place that's uh, located between uh, resources, uh, namely wheat, grain, meat, and lumber. Uh, and that was shipped to Chicago, processed, and then uh, the, you know, the products were moved elsewhere. And increasingly, uh, the processing became ever more sophisticated. By the late 19th century, the, the stock market lost, gradually lost its uh, influence, actually, the Slaughtering took place in other places like Fort Worth and Kansas City. 
Chicago becomes the place where the prices were fixed. So the it becomes sort of like a sophisticated meta uh, marketplace. And to this very day, the Board of Trade is based in Chicago. So that's where all the prices for commodities are fixed. Uh, so grain and meat. So quite uh, fascinating. That already all happens in the 19th century. So that is a little bit the background. The 19th century is a period of dramatic change. People are on the move. Everybody is on the move. People have to look for new opportunities. And uh, for Jews, this is by and large a good story. So there are different interpretations of Jewish migrations. And I have to talk a little bit about this because they're very, people are subscribing to sort of uh, very powerful narratives. And my job as an academic is actually to sort of raise questions about such narratives. and really say, well, you know, it's a little more complicated and maybe this narrative is not even true. Uh, so the big picture here is uh, around 1800, uh, and that doesn't really change until 1880, 80% of all Jews around the world lived in Eastern Europe. So Eastern Europe is uh, what's today, Poland, Ukraine, Belarus, Baltic Republics, Hungary, Romania, broadly speaking. That's where 80% of the world Jewish population was there were smaller centers in the Middle East and Sephardi Jews living around the Mediterranean, but the the overwhelming majority uh, of the Jewish population were Ashkenazi Jews living in Eastern Europe. And the 20th century is a period of dramatic change, right? So the Eastern European center declines, uh, Jews are leaving. Two million Jews moved from Eastern Europe just to the United States between 80, 1880 and 1914. So the United States emerges as a new center. And then, of course, the Holocaust is the almost complete destruction of uh, what was left of the Eastern European center. Uh, and we have another new center rising, which is the state of Israel. Uh, so by the end of the 20th century, Eastern Europe is marginal. And there are two new centers that didn't were hardly existent by the end of the 19th century, United States and uh, Israel. So that's sort of the big backdrop here. The German Jews and the Russian Jews, I had already mentioned that. Uh, so both terms are tricky. Uh, so uh, the terms don't actually show up in the sources very much. Uh, many Jews who came from Central Europe, you know, roughly between 1820 and 1880, were very proud of Germanness, uh, but only in a cultural sense. So they were not so excited about the German nation state. Uh, they were very anxiously watching what was going on in Germany, rise of anti-Semitism in the 1880s. Uh, so the identification with Germany is really cultural. Uh, and the term German Jews really only makes sense in the synagogue, actually, because it was a synonym, a synonym for modern. So German Jews is a synonym for modern Jews, essentially for reform Jews, because the reform movement really originated in Central Europe, and it faced a lot of obstacles there, and uh, did not hear. So reform Judaism really flourished uh, in the period before and after the Civil War. Uh, and uh, so Germanness is primarily a, a term with meaning in the synagogue, actually. Um, and the term German Jews, I've hardly come across it before 1880. Uh, it's really more of a projection uh, of Jews who came after 1880, and they said all oh, these these established Jews, they're the German Jews. Um, uh, the term Russian Jews is also tricky because not all Jews who came from Eastern Europe actually came from the uh, Russian Empire. Some came from Aus the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So it's also a tricky term. So we have to be very careful. These are more images. Uh, they they are indicating class and status. So German Jews were often the established middle class, upper middle class. Russian Jews is more it was a synonym for working class. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's we have to be very cautious as historians, like who's using this term. And uh, I, I would not use it in a text. I'm much more careful and say immigrants from a certain place in Eastern Europe uh, along those lines. Uh, what also matters is the time of arrival. Um, uh, so that's important, you know, when did people actually come, where did they come from, where did they settle, uh, that is also interesting in an American context, you know, neighborhoods matter. Um, and I think, uh, what is also important, uh, 
and this is a very powerful image that people were uh, were expelled or fleeing the pogroms and the people came in waves. Uh, so I don't like this very much as a historian. Generally, my impression is, and I've looked at a lot of material about Jewish migrations and other migrations, uh, it's a story of agency. People took decisions. Uh, nobody was entirely free. Some people fled obligations, but people kind of had a pretty good sense of what they were getting into. They had good information. And uh, almost all migrants, uh, Jews and non-Jews, belong to networks. Uh, and many of you will have heard of the Landsmannschaften. That's really important for Jews who came from Eastern Europe, but it's also important for Jews from the uh, German states in Central Europe, as I'll show uh, in my uh, images very soon. So Central Europe, uh, this is uh, a map of Central Europe in 1812. This is still under Napoleonic rule, but uh, I'm just showing this map to give you a little bit of a sense. Uh, Central Europe uh, uh, was made up of a whole bunch of small states. Um, and each state treated its uh, Jewish population differently. Some states had actually banned uh, Jews from their territory, but that's all changing under Napoleon, uh, so that Napoleon is good for Jews because it sort of uh, brings, uh, give, provide, you know, the French provided Jews with rights, uh, almost complete equality. And, uh, but the, uh, you know, in a sense, the, the conditions differed a lot, the legal conditions across Central Europe. And it, it, the map looks pretty messy, and it was pretty messy because because once Napoleon was defeated, uh, each of these states uh, basically devised their own policy towards their Jewish subjects, I, I should say. And uh, the emancipation of Jews in Central Europe dragged on for decades. So Jews in France were already fully emancipated with the French Revolution, more or less. There are some changes under Napoleon, but by and large, Jews in France are fully emancipate their citizens, that is Jewish men, not women. Um, and uh, in the German states, the emancipation dragged on until the founding of the German nation state in 1871. So uh, that's definitely a reason to consider leaving. But it turns out that uh, for most migrants, that was not so much the issue. Uh, like for Christians who were leaving at this point, it was really about economic issues. The Economy was changing, people lost their jobs, Jewish uh, peddlers lost their customers, um, and everybody is looking towards America. There are more opportunities, seems really promising. Uh, and usually th what happens is somebody goes over there and then writes a letter. People find out that there's jobs, there's opportunities, come over, and they're coming. Uh, and sometimes they send money. Later, at the end of the 19th century, many Jews from Eastern Europe uh, did actually get prepaid tickets from their relatives in America. So they get a ticket and they hop on a train and start the journey. So when I started my research, so this is a part of the map. I just go back here. It shows sort of this area here, Southwest Germany. When I started my research in Chicago, I, um, I was very lucky there, uh, um, I could draw on some uh, sort of older publications from the late 19th century. And also there are older cemeteries in Chicago. Uh, in fact, there's a very old Jewish cemetery near Wrigley Field. Really recommend visiting that. And it often provides information about the birthplaces. So all I, what I decided to do was put these birthplaces on a map. And uh, I had already suspected that uh, these migrants came from neighboring villages. And it turns out, as you can see here, uh, there were clusters uh, of these villages, uh, and the people who came from these villages all knew each other. They had intermarried long before the migration, uh, and they stuck together in Chicago also. Um, and so uh, this is clearly a Landsmannschaft network. Uh, this is actually the network that founded Sinai Congregation, so the preeminent reform congregation in Chicago. And... Um, so that's one piece of information, uh, not surprising. What I find much more surprising is what happened on the other side. Uh, so I used the census uh, extensively. Um, and the census does provide information about uh, the birthplace of children. Uh, it doesn't necessarily provide the actual town, but it does give information about the birth state. 
and so I was uh, the gray, uh, the states in gray here are places where Jews who eventually settled in Chicago uh, had children. Uh, so I can I know that many came through states like Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut. Uh, and for some Jews, I was able to find out with other sources that they had lived uh, in small towns uh, in the vicinity of Chicago. And this is by and large a story of peddling. So what happens here is it's usually brothers and sisters uh, in their 20s uh, or even late teens coming to uh, New York. They already know they want to go to Chicago because there's already somebody there but they know it's too expensive. They can't just make it in the city. They have nothing. They are. They have a pretty good education. They can read and write. Uh, most Jewish uh, men and boys attended really good schools in Jewish community schools, even in small villages in the German states. And um, they needed to raise some money. So they work as peddlers. They move to a small town uh, and they go on the road and they start selling stuff. And then after a year or two, they have enough for a small store in this town. This could be a, this is what happened in Belfont, by the way. Uh, it happened in many small towns in uh, along the East Coast. Uh, it uh, Some ended up going to the South. There were a lot of opportunities there before the Civil War, uh, but often they didn't stay very long. It's often two years here, two years there, uh, you know, uh, finding a new opportunity, little bigger store. And all the while, uh, for quite a few of these young men and women, one member of that family is already in Chicago. And when once they had enough money, they moved to Chicago and then they all partner and launch small businesses, often retail, um, often wholesale. And I had talked about it. Chicago is a city that's rapidly growing. There's tons of opportunities. There's all these things coming in. So there are many, many opportunities, especially in the garment sector, this is entirely new, right? Uh, uh, and it's actually, uh, you don't need a lot of capital to start a small sweatshop to make, uh, you know, uh, uh, a garment that could be like jeans, pants. Uh, one of the most famous stories uh, is uh, connected to San Francisco, but it also begins in the Midwest, Levi Strauss. So uh, company is still around, Levi's jeans. He uh, actually moves to uh, Louisville uh, and uh, also works as a peddler. I think there's a brother in Louisville. Uh, he comes from a small village in Franconia, North Bavaria. And then he moved to San Francisco, like many, uh, uh, also many Jews who uh, eventually settled in Chicago, spent time in California in the late 1840s, early 1850s, uh, not so much looking for gold, but more working around, like providing services, uh, uh, selling stuff uh, and making money. And then they go back to Chicago and invested in a small retail or wholesale business, and uh, many did quite well. Um, the bigger story here is uh, these uh, high mobility uh, correlates with social high social mobility. So those uh, who were on the move all the time had a much higher chance of rising into what we today would call the middle class. Uh, and what is truly fascinating about the story is that I'd say about 80, 90% of these migrants uh, rose in one generation from poor peddlers who had grown up poor in villages in Central Europe to uh, you know owning a nice house in Chicago uh, or Cleveland or Cincinnati, uh, having a small business that was doing well. They have a domestic, they have children and they're doing really well and they're able uh, their kids often become lawyers, physicians. So it's a real success story. Um, and um, okay, so I was also curious what was going on in Chicago itself, actually, where did you settle? So that's really possible. I mentioned the census uh, and address books. I did a lot of this research before these records were digitized. Uh, today, that's a little easier. But I basically uh, found uh, that the information in older histories was accurate. Uh, basically, there's a, a, a concentration, a small Jewish neighborhood in the time before the Civil War in the area, the southern part of the loop, so around the area where the Chicago Public Library building is today, in case you're familiar with the city. Uh, but then Jews sort of ended up moving more to the near south side, 
and you see this big gray area on the map in the middle, that's the Chicago fire, which essentially wiped out the whole center of the city and the north side. Uh, that Those were areas where not many Jews were living, uh, but there's another fire in 1874, which hit the near south side. So uh, these catastrophes were quite common in American cities. Uh, think about San Francisco, other cities had fire catastrophes, many, Buildings were, uh, you know, made out of wood, uh, so the cities burned pretty quickly. Um, and it's really a fascinating story how the community was able to support Jews affected by the fire or by these two fires. And uh, it didn't really, it was not a big, uh, the impact was actually quite limited in many ways. And for the city, the fire was uh, uh, actually good. It sounds very cynical to say this because it wiped the whole downtown area clean and Chicago became actually the first city that had a central business district where there were no people living there. Uh, so they were able to build entirely new buildings focused on various economic uh, for economic purposes. I mentioned the processing of grain and uh, meat and also lumber and a lot of that, uh, uh, these businesses benefited from the fire, ironically. The stockyards were far away from the fire, so that wasn't even affected. What I found quite interesting about Chicago is that Jews uh, began to disperse. So these are the Jews from Central Europe. They really dispersed into different parts of the city after the fire. So that's so it's not that all Jews lived together in one neighborhood. They actually dispersed. They lived around different congregations, and the congregations were in different parts of the city. Then, of course, things change uh, 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 quite dramatically. I'm just jumping ahead here. Uh, this is what happens later. So I tracked the location of Jewish congregations and many uh, moved to the south side, uh, uh, which became a big center of Jewish life in the period before the Second World War. Uh, and then, of course, we have this huge Jewish uh, settlement concentration on the west side. Those are Jews from Eastern Europe. And just to give you some numbers, uh, in 1880, there were not more than 10,000 Jews in Chicago. By 1920, it's probably up to 300,000. So that's a dramatic increase. And most of these new immigrants lived on the, on the near west side in an area that became known as ghetto, also known as Maxwell Street area. And that also played out in cities like Philadelphia and of course, New York. In Philadelphia, it's the south side, it's the big immigrant neighborhood. And Jews lived next uh, door with other immigrants who came in this period, Italians uh, in particular, and also other Eastern Europeans. So Poles, Ukrainians, uh, Lithuanians, really important in Chicago, same in uh, Philadelphia. And um, I just wanna talk a little bit about the background. Uh, uh, I did quite a bit of research uh, about the Jews from Eastern Europe, why did they start leaving? I already mentioned that the pogroms actually had very little to do with this migration. Uh, this is also a migration that has, a, a, it's really about economic opportunities. Um, most migrants from Eastern Europe, uh, Jewish migrants, uh, came actually from uh, the Northern part of the Russian pale. So from the area that's today, that's basically known as Lithuania, uh, but also encompasses Belarus, uh, contemporary Lithuania and Latvia uh, and parts of northeastern Poland. Uh, and there was very little uh, violence in this in these areas. Uh, it was much more limited. Much of the pogroms actually took place in what's today Ukraine. Um, and uh, Ukraine was actually an area where many Jews moved to within the Russian Empire because it was an area experiencing uh, economic growth. The Lithuanian area on the north was extremely poor and destitute. And people, once people had a chance uh, to get out of this area, they started leaving, uh, Jews and non-Jews. And the big part in the story is the railroads. Uh, the first railroad that reaches this area uh, reaches it much, much later than Central Europe and Western Europe, only in the 1860s. Um, and once the railroad is complete in 1862, the, the migration really begins. The railroad was a mixed blessing. I don't want to say the railroads were good. Uh, so the railroads basically displaced uh, a lot of uh, Jewish middlemen from their, their roles as peddlers because they were selling stuff. 
And all of a sudden, the railroad with the railroad, people had access to, uh, they could just travel to Warsaw, to nearby towns and buy things in stores. And uh, some uh, Jewish, middle, Jewish peddlers did really well out of this, but uh, most really didn't. And uh, uh, many lost their jobs, basically. They couldn't really sell stuff anymore in this new changing economy. And uh, they usually had many siblings. Uh, it's, it's poor. Everybody is starving. So uh, the train makes it possible to, to leave. And that's what many did. And uh, the first, I know in Chicago, first the first Jews from Lithuania are already uh, showing up in the mid 1860s, right after the Civil War. And then they pulled in other people, right? So once one of them, one person is there, their opportunities, their jobs, they pull each other over. And what I found also interesting, the stereotype is they're all poor and they're, you know, asking for money from the wealthier Jews. That's not true. Uh, so for Chicago, at least, I know that many of these Lithuanian Jewish migrants uh, did also quite well. And they had their own support networks. They did not really ask for support from the established Jews. So much more complex picture. And uh, um, what I was also interested in a sense uh, in, and you can maybe ask questions about this uh, in a few minutes, how did people actually travel? Uh, and so I looked uh, a lot at railroads and also at steamships. And I just, I'm not gonna go into that too much. Uh, my book will be published in July. <laughs> Uh, essentially, the the people who built the railroads in Eastern Europe often were Jewish investors. So this is a fascinating story. Some were from Eastern Europe, but this railroad from Warsaw to St. Petersburg that had a branch line through Lithuania was actually built by two Sephardi Jews from France, the Pereira brothers, Isaac and Emile Pereira. Fascinating story. And there's a lot written about them, but it all deals with France and what they did in France. They actually built the first French railroad from Paris to Saint-Germain suburb in the 1830s. Uh, but this railroad in Eastern Europe, is the impact is really enormous. Um, they also founded a steamship line, it's quite interesting. Uh, the largest steamship line uh, that really dominated migration from Eastern Europe was the Hamburg America line. And the steamship, uh, the uh, chief executive of this steamship line also happened to be Jewish. Uh, Albert Berlin was his name. So there's, there are other Jewish stories connected to these uh, mass mobilities uh, and migrations. Um, I was able to find quite a few photos. Uh, this is a photo showing Jewish migrants from the Russian empire and aid workers in Hamburg. Uh, it's quite possible that uh, some of these Jews went to Chicago and I was like these photos, you can see the children are all blurry uh, because they didn't, they moved. They couldn't, because you had to stand still for like an, a minute uh, and the photographers are pretty tough on this, but the kids obviously uh, couldn't. And so that's always quite cute about these pictures. And it shows also quite clearly on the right, uh, as the two men on the table are German Jews uh, or there's three men and the people in the background uh, and the people on the left are these migrants. And the uh, German Jews, uh, in, and these are German Jews in Germany, uh, really made sure that the migrants did get kosher food, that they were uh, protected, uh, protected against abuse, against anti-Semitism. So they really built up a pretty sophisticated support network. And this is actually a support network that reached around the globe. So they were, uh, this is not just German Jews, but French, English, Jews in Argentina and Brazil, they really made sure that Jews on the traveling were protected. And even in tiny towns on the border or somewhere along the railroads, even in Australia somewhere, there, there was always somebody there uh, that migrants could, could uh, go to for help. Uh, it's really fascinating, fascinating how sophisticated this support network was. Um, and they published about this. So I have really information about you know, how much did it cost they sent us to Eastern Europe. How much does it cost to take the train from Sydney in Australia to Melbourne or something like that? So they had information about it and they made it available to migrants. And these pictures, of course, were uh, taken to uh, this uh, were taken to impress donors, German Jewish middle class German Jews, to uh, give money to this German Jewish Hilfsverein, the German Jewish Aid Association. 
that looked after migrants. Um, and so the photos always show that, of course, the aid workers were very efficient and uh, they often show children. Uh, uh, and it was, you know, there's a purpose behind these photos. But I really like the photos because they give a little bit of a glimpse uh, at this uh, story. The story ends uh, uh, not so well. I'm coming to the end here. Uh, 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 there was growing opposition towards uh, immigration uh, in many places um, in the United States, um, especially in rural areas. This is uh, uh, eerily reminiscent of the period we're living in today. Uh, this whole talk about the border and fears was coming across the border. Um, while there's actually a shortage of labor in many places. Um, in uh, 1921, uh, Congress passed a very restrictive uh, uh, quota bill that was uh, not very implicitly uh, uh, anti-Semitic. So Jews were one of the groups that they wanted to exclude to Congress. Uh, and all you have to do is look at the debates uh, among uh, senators and House members. And they openly talk about the fact that their Jews from Eastern Europe are not welcome. Uh, uh, and there are some pretty awful anti-Semitic remarks in the, uh, in the record even of uh, Congress. And um, this, uh, uh, I, I think this is a, uh, this cartoon is uh, really uh, 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 something, a very powerful cartoon. I think it's from a Yiddish, Daily paper, Der Größer, Der Größer Kundes, uh, uh, and this was published in May 1921 when this bill passed, and essentially it shows the Statue of Liberty committing suicide, uh, and it says to uh, translate it, if the Statue of Liberty were a living person, so uh, she would commit suicide, and on her suicide note, it reads, after my friends harassed, betrayed, and deserted me, I no longer have a reason to live in this world. So these immigration restrictions uh, in 1924, Congress passed another bill that made it even stricter, were a disaster for Jews in Eastern Europe. Uh, that's a big, big point in my book uh, because there were hundreds of thousands of Jews who wanted to come to America and they were excluded. Many of these Jews had been displaced during the First World War. Uh, they couldn't go to America. Other countries were not really an option because they had no family, no networks there because these networks were essential to, to get people started in the new world. And uh, so uh, many, many of many Holocaust victims were Jews who wanted to go to the United States, but they couldn't because of these restrictions. The members of Congress could not know that in uh, the early 1920s. Uh, but the point is that uh, the US pursued a very restrictive immigration policy in the late 1930s very belatedly, uh, the U.S. opened gates, uh, its gates for German and Austrian Jews, but not for Jews from Eastern Europe. So the State, the State Department rigidly stuck with these quotas that were designed to keep out Eastern Europeans, especially Jews from Eastern Europe. And so it's, it's not a happy end story. Uh, the upshot for Jews in Chicago, however, was that this constant migration, constantly people arriving, there were tens of thousands arriving every year in the 1890s, in the 1900s, that sort of stopped uh, in 1924. And that provides really the chance for Jews in cities like Chicago, but also Philadelphia to actually build communities. That was very difficult as, you know, when constantly new people are coming, it's very hard to bring them all together. So uh, the beginning of these federations uh, in cities like Chicago and Philadelphia, that's really a product of the 20s when it becomes easier uh, to build uh, communities. Okay, I ended here. Uh, so I'm looking forward to some questions. Um, and I'm just gonna end the share here so that I can see the, uh, the questions. And you can also uh, contact me by email or reach out to me, I'm available if you have questions. Uh, and uh, uh, this book about the Jewish migration from Eastern Europe is coming out in July, so it's not out yet. Uh, so yeah, any Tobias, questions? Tobias, first of all, thank you for taking, uh, giving us the uh, opportunity to hear something that's very complicated 
and you boiled it down and made it very uh, uh, easily understandable and, and very interesting. Thank you. Uh, my question is, the migration towards Chicago, did Jews stop on their way in central Pennsylvania, and were they responsible for building some of the Jewish communities in this region? Yeah, so I... I belong to a relatively small group of uh, scholars in American Jewish history who are actually interested in small towns. Uh, so uh, I started with Chicago, but then I realized all these migrants uh, transitioned to small towns, not just in Illinois and Indiana, but also Pennsylvania. And that is a story I think that largely still has to be written. So um, I'm working with uh, the Indiana Jewish Historical Society and also the, what is it called? The Illinois Jewish Genealogical Society uh, uh, with people who are actively researching that. It's actually quite easy to do start research on this uh, um, because of uh, the digitization of records, right? Uh, it's much easier now once you have access to ancestry.com to look up people. Uh, and I, I did this just for the fun of it for Belfont here. That's the town just over. Uh, that's uh, much older than State College. And uh, there's a Jewish cemetery there. And uh, in a sense, starting with, just with the names, if they're still readable, uh, and then working your way into ancestry.com uh, will lead to a lot of information. I had the advantage, I can access an archive that's not accessible to genealogists uh, at Harvard Business School uh, credit rating reports. Uh, this is a quite ironic story. So around the 1840s, as more and more people move west, uh, there's a business, uh, a bit new business niche uh, for a credit uh, rating. Uh, so we all, of course, have this today. I mean, anybody applying for the credit card. Um, uh, basically, a business businesses uh, were created uh, that, that it essentially tracked people's credit histories. And if you uh, did get a request from somebody who wanted uh, to borrow money, uh, wanted to get money from you, and let's say you were a banker, of course, you wanted to know a little bit about this person. Like, is this a trustworthy individual? And usually locally, people say, yeah, it's fine, you know, whatnot. But you could go to this business and say, you know, do you have any records on this person? And it turns out, yeah, uh, this guy was in Arizona 10 years ago, and he cheated lots of creditors. So that's very helpful. So you might not want to give that person any money. And these records from the 1840s to the 1880s are kept at uh, Harvard Business School. The business was called Dun & Bradstreet uh, or R.G. Dunn initially. And it's a little bit of an ironic story. The founder, uh, his name was Louis Stepan, was a famous abolitionist, but he was also anti-Semitic. So every record uh, on Jewish business owners does state that these people were Jewish and they're often anti-Semitic uh, uh, remarks on the side. My favorite remark is uh, about the Jewish business owner. These They are Jews. They stole the jewels when they left Egypt. I mean, <laughs> this is, uh, remember, we are talking about like old-fashioned Christian anti-Semitic stereotypes, right? Uh, this is quite ridic ridiculous. I also found uh, remarks where they miss identified people and they say, oh, they're actually not Jewish, they're honest Germans. Uh, so the interesting thing for Chicago is, so I looked at these uh, comments for a longer period, they all vanish. After the Civil War, they completely vanish. And the reason is very simple. Uh, business people in Chicago got to know their Jewish uh, business partners and they realized these stereotypes were complete nonsense uh, and that Jews were just as trustworthy as everybody else. And I had one case of actually a one Jewish uh, business owner who was actually uh, not very honest, and they don't even mention he was Jewish in the 1880s. Quite interesting. So it was this this vanishes. So Jews were quite well integrated, and there's various examples of um, leading business uh, 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 folks in Chicago coming out defending uh, Jewish businessmen and uh, women uh, against anti-Semitic uh, stereotypes. But to make a long story short small towns were stopover places. So small town Jewish history is the story of enormous fluctuation. So there's constantly people coming and going, coming to look for opportunities, make a little money. Others already made a little money, they're moving on. Uh, and 
reconstructing that is really hard work, uh, but it's possible. Uh, we have the census, we have uh, various other records and uh, and essentially very little work has been done. There's uh, the book by Lee Shai Weisbach, uh, that's sort of an overview study. There's a pretty good book about the Ohio Valley, but for other parts of the country that's still uh, to be done. And it's a fun project if you have some time on your hands uh, to really start researching small towns. We are doing a little work in the Jewish studies program here. We are actually collecting information for small town communities in Pennsylvania. Uh, we started collecting postcards. So uh, today that's completely out of fashion, but uh, until I'd say the 1940s or so, uh, there were endless amounts of postcards for everything in a, in a small town, including a Jewish owned business, uh, a synagogue, uh, and people collect this and we started buying on eBay and we have already quite a bit of a collection that's part of the special collections here at our library. So you can visit and look this up and we are still working on expanding that. There's a question, when did the quotas keeping Jews out end yeah. and why did they end? So these quotas, that's a, that's a really notorious thing. The quotas are based uh, on countries. Uh, so um, Germany did get a very generous quota, uh, about 30,000 per year. Uh, England, so Britain did get a very generous quota. So the idea behind these laws was to benefit uh, immigrants from certain countries. And those countries were essentially Scandinavian countries, Germany, British Isles. Uh, why? Because members of Congress preferred uh, Protestant and white immigrants. They did not want immigrants from Africa, Asia. So countries like any country in Africa, their annual quota was something like 50 or so. So that was uh, the idea. Um, one ironic outcome of all of this is that uh, nobody had anticipated that the Nazis would come to power. So German and Austrian Jews benefited ironically from this quota, the quota wasn't actually created to uh, to allow Jews from Germany in, but they were the ones who really had to get out and uh, they really benefited from this. And unfortunately, only very belatedly, the quotas were uh, not filled after the Great Depression hit. Uh, President Hoover issued an executive order essentially stopping immigration. So there's no immigration to the US for almost a decade. Uh, it is only after the Kristallnacht program that FDR basically is, uh, instructs the State Department to really issue visas. And the German quota was fully filled for 1939. And uh, I always like to mention this, 50% uh, of all immigrants, legal immigrants to the United States in 1939 were Jewish. That's that's an enormous number for a very small group, right? It gives you a sense of the, the pressure for Jews to leave Europe. Um, the quotas for Eastern Europe are very low, right? So uh, that's the idea. The quota for Italy was very low. Uh, the quotas are not connected to citizenship. They were connected to your place of birth. This is very sinister because let's say uh, here's somebody who's Jewish from Poland, uh, moves to France after the First World War. Here the Germans come in 1940. They want to get out. Uh, they apply for a US visa forget it, because they fell under the Polish quota because they were born in Poland. The fact that they were French citizens was irrelevant. So it's it's birthplace, not citizenship. Very important. The quotas were never really abolished. They're still around, uh, uh, but they were effectively abolished in 1965. So uh, it took, uh, for most of the 20th century, the US pursued a very restrictive immigration policy from 1921 to 1965. And they didn't entirely go away. So I can uh, testify to that. Uh, when I moved here, I did get a, my citizenship within five years, really quick. I got a green card right away. If I would have come from China or India, uh, I would probably still wait for my green card uh, because China and India send a lot of immigrants to the United States uh, and the quota still applies. So 
uh, colleagues here at Penn State who come from countries like Mexico, India, China, uh, just waiting for a green card can take many, many, many years. And without a green card, when uh, uh, immigrants are on a work visa, you're literally tied to your employer. So you can't just move jobs. Uh, with a green card, you can do that. Uh, and so in a way, these quotas never really went away. Uh, the only thing that was changed in 1965 was that, uh, you know, sort of in a sense, this, this, uh, the discrimination based on quotas was basically abolished. So uh, they tried not to sort of, you know, give no zero quota to countries they didn't like. So, uh, but the size still plays a role. So people from small countries have it much easier than people from countries that send a lot of immigrants to this country. Um, so here's a question from Paul and Dana, Washington. Um, yeah, so this is a good question. So I recommend the book by Hasia Diner uh, about um, peddling, just to give you a little bit of sense. She did a lot of research uh, about these sort of small town experiences. Yes, so in a sense, Jews became an integral part of these small towns and the peddlers often stayed at uh, with Christians, sometimes even over various holidays. Uh, there are stories of Jewish peddlers uh, who were literally stuck during the high holidays and they had to stay somewhere. And uh, there are many stories of Christians being quite helpful and aware and aware of, uh, you know, that Jews don't eat certain things um, and vice versa. So a peddler would help out Christians over Christmas or something. Uh, so there are a lot of these stories. Um, and by and large, they're good stories. I mean, there are some stories of discrimination, uh, but I have not come across stories of violence or abuse. Uh, it certainly happened. I mean, there so, certainly were peddlers who were robbed. Uh, my favorite story is... Uh, uh, a story that I, where I sort of scratched my head when I saw this. This is the story of Josef Schaffner. He's connected to this network that I talked about earlier from the Palatinate. Uh, these were, you know, uh, Jews from small villages near Worms, Kaiserslautern in, in uh, southwest Germany, who mostly moved to Chicago. One uh, family that is tied to this network moved to Cleveland. And uh, 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 one of the later, one of the most successful American business uh, owners, uh, Josef Schaffner was his name. He was born in 1848 in Ohio. And he was later one of the partners of Hart Schaffner and Marx, the clothing company. And uh, so I looked at his birthplace and that was really weird. He was born in a, there was, there's even today, there's nothing there. It's just a field. Uh, it's a township formally, but there's nothing there right between Columbus and Cleveland. So the explanation is fairly simple. Uh, I think that his dad was a peddler and his mother came along and he came probably a little early uh, in the middle of nowhere. And that was where his birth was registered. It's really a cute story because it shows that uh, when somebody is born in the middle of nowhere, it's pretty clear that his parents were probably peddlers. Uh, and I find it interesting that the mother clearly had gone along on, on this trip. I know that by 1850, Schaffner's parents had a store in Cleveland. So that would sort of uh, make sense. Yeah, so the peddlers are very much tied into these local towns. The problem is that a lot of that, these stories have been lost, right? Because people didn't record it. Sometimes they did. And Hasia Diner collected a few of these stories in uh, her book. Here's a question. Uh, yeah, synagogues, uh, I'm not so sure that synagogues were not permitted in Connecticut. So the only uh, issue uh, that I know of, of anti-Jewish restrictions were a couple states, North Carolina and New Hampshire, uh, required uh, any elected official to take Christian a Christian oath. So that excluded Jews, and but those were abolished by the middle decades of the 19th century. Otherwise, uh, there may have been discrimination, but uh, my favorite story about the synagogue is uh, the first synagogue in New York City was built in the 1720s, when it was actually not, Jews were not allowed to do this, but they just built a synagogue and nobody cared, it was okay. 
uh, but the first Catholic church was only built in 1785 after the American Revolution. So Catholics clearly were not allowed to build a church, but Jews already had a synagogue by the 1720s. I mean, the reason for this is Jews were a very small group. They were not seen as a threat or as a problem. Uh, so, yeah. The, how did people get to these railroads? That's exactly, that's a really good question. The uh, Yeah, they walked. Uh, so the railroad network in Eastern Europe was were not very dense. Uh, in Western and Central Europe, it's very dense. But uh, these early Jewish migrants from Central Europe uh, who came from the Palatinate, they often walked two or three days to the closest railroad station. So walking is very much part of the story. So they couldn't take a lot of luggage. Um, and in Eastern Europe, exactly the same. So they sometimes traveled by boat. Uh, they often walk distances uh, to the train station. And uh, yeah, that's very much part of it. Uh, and then, of course, the railroad networks got a little more dense. And so that made it easier to reach uh, uh, railroad stations. Yeah, so I don't see any more questions. Any any other questions? Okay, so please, uh, I look forward, uh, you know, please attend the other talks by my colleagues. They also do really exciting research. Uh, do feel free to email, contact me. Uh, I'm always happy to help with uh, queries about genealogical research migration. And um, yeah, thanks so much for attending uh, today and keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Brinkman. Thank you. Uh, an exciting start to our series. Uh, on February 6th, Professor Eric Fleisch will speak on Israel Today. In March, Professor Bertina Brandt will speak about a Holocaust survivor who lives in State College. And in April, Professor Ann Killebrew will speak about Akko Israel Archaeological Expedition. So we have a lot to look forward to, and this has been a wonderful start. Thank you so much. Thank you.